We will never go back to working the way that we used to work. Companies and ourselves are embracing digital alternatives with exponential speed that we never saw before. Necessity is the mother of invention. COVID-19 is the accelerator of innovation. COVID-19 has created immense change for everybody. No country has been left untouched by its impacts, which continue to reverberate around the world. But how permanent will this change be? In this series, we've looked at how COVID-19 has affected consumers, corporates, and the government, and will shape the economic prospects of the future generation. We've heard from experts around the world and analyzed the latest data to get a complete picture of everything that's happening. And now as some economies attempt to reopen, will everything return back to normal? In this final episode, we look at how our societies could be reshaped by our attitudes towards urban living and the workplace and our use of technology in our everyday lives. This crisis may also throw up some incredible opportunities through the concentration and acceleration of some of the trends that were already shaping society even before the virus took hold. Many people relish the opportunity to work from home, whereas for others, they can't wait to get back to the office community. In the long run, however, it may be the employer who defines whether there'll be any long-term changes to our working habits. Most people think Work from home is now business as usual, but it's not. You're still working under a disaster recovery plan, technically. So you need to make sure that that is resilient. We will never go back to working the way that we used to work. Now, that has profound implications for financial markets and industry, which in spite of um, its advances and its, its historic investment in technology is incredibly overwhelmingly a face-to-face people intensive industry. The whole ways of working have changed and that has engendered new thinking. So what I when I think about what's happened during during the last uh, four months or so, it's a real sea change in cultural ways of working. What we will we find acceptable and what we may have been reticent about accepting before. Today, we're, we see that companies and ourselves are embracing digital alternatives with exponential speed that we never saw before. If you were to say in February, we don't need a trading floor, people would have thought you were crazy. And yet that's exactly where people are saying, do we need to support that type of infrastructure? There's a real risk that organizations in the, mix, in the midst of the digital transformation will accelerate automation in the wrong way. Um, you know, what's, what's really important and where success will come is when organizations are able to harness the best of the machines with the best of human talent. Um, the danger is rather than going for automation in what I call the integration model, they're going to go for it via the displacement model, using it as a cheap alternative to human labor. Some people have been able to go to home offices. They've gotten two hours back from no commute, and it has been a wonderful experience for them. Other people have been cooped up in a shared apartment where they're working, as I said, from a bedroom on a laptop while their wife is working at the dining room table and they're both crossing their fingers that the nanny can keep the two-year-old out of their conference calls. Can you grow a business? Can you onboard employees? Can you create a culture? There's so much of, of business that requires, in my view, sort of in-person interaction that I, I think it's... It's a false argument to, to, to think that you could get rid of your office. 60% of companies are saying that people are performing as well or better than before. We know productivity typically is better out, out of the office. Um, you know, there's a lot of pressures on companies in terms of squeezing fewer people into the office. And so given they're not going to go, go out and buy new offices, they'll need to have more people work. So there's some very sound economic pressures for doing that. Urban centres have been a hotspot for the disease, with many people looking to move out to the countryside. Urban centres will evolve, with a younger generation potentially moving in to fill that gap. 
you know, there's a lot of talk in the news today that the COVID crisis is kind of changing, is going to change forever the migration patterns that we've been seeing for the last 20 years. And people are going to flood the suburbs and we're going to de-urbanize and, and the, the future is looking like more like the 60s and 70s and less like the, the last two, two decades. And that's an interesting question. I'm not, I'm not sure I, I believe that. The point is what we've seen is a persistent pull into urban areas. Um, I'm not sure that we're going to see any dramatic shift. I do hope we see people being much more intentional about how they work, where they work, and that might involve being able to work from the country more often. It might involve avoiding commutes. I would hope that one of the things that happens as a result of this, I doubt it, one of the things that could happen is we see congestion at peak hours reducing because it's just crazy. It's a waste of time for everyone and it's time out of life for the people involved. Um, but I don't think we're going to see any mass exodus. One particular segment of office is likely to have a lot of problems in the future, and that's the super high-end luxury class A plus office towers in big cities. You can run a law from largely from, from home. Now they're not going to give up their office completely, but instead of having five or six floors, they're going to have a few, one or two. So there's going to be a huge decline in, in office demand for these like these premium locations. And, but it's going to take time. And the reason it's going to take time is these most of these folks are on leases. It's the young people that want to get back to work in the office more so than it is more mature workers, right? They miss their friends. They miss the interaction. Uh, life work balance, you know, sort of revolves around your place of employment for a lot of these folks and they miss it. Retail has changed and technology has been the clear winner with all generations adapting to remote living and online leisure and retail. Banking and payment systems are also evolving to our changing online patterns of consumption. If necessity is the mother of invention, COVID-19 is the accelerator of innovation. The experience over the last four months will actually help propel the innovations in uh, digitization that will enable us over time to offer a much and ultimately much better ex experience for our clients. I look at COVID as an accelerant to the digital age. You know, it's, it's pushed remote work to all time highs. Um, it's accelerating the value proposition of non-state money, Bitcoin, um, and it's encouraging the decentralization of governments and corporations. So I think, although the economic shock has been very brutal short term, I think the more we move towards a world that's not dominated by central planners and state interference, the better the world becomes. I believe in the power of uh, innovation. I believe in the power of uh, technology as a force for good. We see quite a bit of uh, new ideas emerging uh, and uh, uh, individuals being open to opportunities related to technology that they previously were not. Technology is clearly the winner. Um, and the loser, as you say, is everything that um, uh, belongs to the old world, <laughs> the pre-COVID-19 world. The stay-at-home economy has picked up a significant momentum. If you look at how well the streaming um, industries are doing, such as Disney Plus, for example. And I do see companies uh, taking advantage of these opportunities. One of the key accelerants through this process has been the digitalization of the customer base. And I think that helps. I mean, there's some upfront costs, clearly, in terms of accelerating uh, toward a digital bank. Going into a store here, it says contactless payments uh, preferred. Right, we don't want to take money anymore. Um, we, uh, you know, so so I have, you know, I have all different ways of paying on a contact contactless method. Um, so the governments are are recognizing that this is the way of the future, whereas they might have been a little bit more reticent a few years ago. Right now, again, because of COVID nineteen, you want to uh, uh, basically uh, um, promote contactless payment or cashless payment, so you don't have to touch physical cash that potentially could spread COVID-19, the adoption is starting to kick in. Now, whether or not this becomes sustainable is another question for most uh, e-payments company. With regard to technology, I think the big winner 
um, will be out of this cloud technology. We'd already seen a increasing move towards um, cloud delivery of services by many of our clients over the last three to five years, but there's no question that COVID-19 is really propelling that. Eventually, someone's going to have to pay for all of this. Temporary support has created a false economy, but government's going to have to be very careful they don't move too fast to try and make back their revenues. If you're looking to try to stimulate an economy, you're actually looking at VAT cuts. And if you look at the history in, uh, of VAT during uh, and since the last financial crisis, we saw VAT cuts, we then saw those cuts reversed, and then we saw VAT increases. So you might see VAT um, have a short-term dip to stimulate uh, the economy, to stimulate spending, and then that increase to higher levels per, as the governments look to repay this. I suspect the big corporates will remain sufficiently powerful to avoid any serious change in the, in the tax regimes that affect them. I'm not sure that's the case, and I hope it won't be the case, but I think it's likely. But in a crisis of this kind, how we come out politically is, I think, the least predictable thing of all. In this position, we may see new taxes, but we also may see a whole um, rethink about how fiscal measures and monetary measures are, are brought together. And that's something that is definitely uh, going to be something to watch as we look forward. We may also see governments use this moment to shift attitudes on sustainability and health issues. Europe is using this as an opportunity not to step away from the agenda on sustainability. And sustainability not only in terms of climate change, but also in terms of social responsibility. So we're looking at this from a refinitive perspective as to how it is that you can start financing a just recovery. How is it that you can use capital raised from the capital markets, as well as some of the capital that is being pushed into the ECB through the, uh, through the funds for recovery? How is that going to be monitored to make sure that it is uh, within, the, uh, within the world of a just and right uh, climate change social agenda? So we see questions about whether in this new world where the ability to get uh, health uh, uh, services is much more important, whether we will see things like uh, health uh, surcharges being put on, on top to specifically fund or to hypothecate that revenue directly into health. Travel and leisure have been deeply impacted by COVID-19. Business travel may never fully recover, but our pursuit of pleasure is expected to make a rebound. I happen to think the holiday business, the vacation business, will recover much more quickly and people are not going give, to give up their, the idea of overseas travel. One in 10 people on planet Earth going into this or employed in travel and tourism in the world. 10% of the US of the global workforce was employed in travel and tourism because we were we were everywhere because we could be because it was fun. The planes aren't going to disappear. The slots at the airports aren't going to disappear. Uh, I think possibly the biggest single medium term damaging aspect to it from the airlines point of view is a reduction in business travel. These are the kinds of travel budgets in corporate America that I don't know are necessarily going to come back for a mighty long time because corporations have learned that business meetings don't necessarily need to be, to be five nights at the Four Seasons in Tokyo or whatever. While some parts of the travel industry may be permanently impaired, sport and leisure are already adapting to an online world. I think some of these habits that you've picked up uh, during the lockdown or COVID-19 will continue. Things like, you know, spending more time streaming, spending more time uh, playing games, or even, like as we've said, uh, or everyone's experiencing is this whole teleconferencing um, is going to continue. That will change the way people interact. That will change uh, the way people are entertained. So I do think, um, you know, sports, we may all just be, this is maybe we can't, because we can't sit next to each other at a, at a football match or at a hockey game, um, we're all going to be sort of finding some almost virtual experience. I think that helps a lot of the tech companies for sure. Yes, we see a lot of guys coming in. You've seen, you know, kids actually taking on, you know, professional F1 uh, Grand Prix drivers on the virtual world and actually beating some of them. So I think that that has created a lot more interest uh, in this. And obviously interest and eyeballs will always lead to, you know, um, companies looking at 
uh, marketing or uh, their own brands uh, as, as, as a new channel. Um, so you actually have seen some of this already starting um, in the last couple of years, but really amping it up uh, in this current situation. Ultimately, humans are social creatures who seek out community, and it's this trait that will probably prevent some of our initial knee-jerk reactions from becoming permanent change. But there will be some parts of society who will experience lingering side effects. Evidence shows us that habits are, and people think, well, I've, even the idea that habits take 60 days to put in place. Um, people think, well, I've been in lockdown for 60 days. These habits will stick. Habits are massively context dependent. When we snap back to a post-COVID world, the habits that we think is, we've developed now that seem super important are very likely just to disappear. And so certain things will stick because of economic realities. But relying on human behavior to shift radically and, and our habits to shift radically just because this has happened, I think is a bit overblown at the moment. I'm pretty optimistic that hum humans generally want to congregate. They want to be with other humans. The intimate signaling that goes on in any face-to-face -face conversation, the enjoyment of the company of others, friendship and family in numbers, not just a tiny um, group all isolated together, is what makes life meaningful. One of my big concerns is there's going to be a gender effect that sustains for a while after this. We know that um, 27% or companies are spending 27% less at the moment on diversity and inclusion initiatives. We know after the financial crisis, there was a real underinvestment in diversity following that. We know that diversity is one of the big drivers of innovation um, and success, um, but it seems a bit less crucial. In the home, we're finding that, there's, that the crisis had a disproportionate effect on women. For many, this continues to be an intense experience, but our recovery is already beginning. It is truly global. Every country, every nation is dealing with this. Things may have changed permanently, it's too early to know. Uh, I happen to think that we have existed as social beings for uh, thousands and millions of years, and it's one of the reasons all that cooperation is one of the reasons for the success of Homo sapiens. And I don't see that ending. There's no doubt that we will move to a model that is much more flexible than the financial markets have certainly um, typically offered their employees in the past. One of the things that happens in times of anxiety and confusion is people become more social rather than less social. The latest and greatest data shows that 46% of consumers will continue to shop more locally once the outbreak is over. I think we will revert to most of our old habits in terms of hugging and handshakes and being with other people and the intimate um, connections that we forge uh, when we see people face to face. And it's just likely that especially as we um, exit home again, we're gonna go a little crazy. We've been dealing with viruses for thousands of years. Thousands of years. The COVID crisis is still evolving. Households and communities have been impacted unequally. Our shift online has taken place with breathtaking speed. The workplace has changed. London's financial district remains virtually empty, even after the lockdown has been lifted. Government support continues to flood the system. But for how long? Change creates uncertainty, but change can also create incredible opportunity. Whilst we don't know how our economies will fare once governments roll back the support schemes of the last few months, what we can see is how people have embraced the change that has been forced upon them by the dislocations of the COVID-19 era. Whilst most of the people we spoke to thought that change was coming, they saw it more as an evolution rather than a sudden change in our behaviours and the way that we do business. As long as our governments can be sensible in how they roll back support so they don't undermine the nascent recovery and reopening of some of our economies, then we might be able to combine both the change we have to now embrace with an opportunity to rebuild out of the depths of this crisis. Thank you.